Hey, welcome to the Tales of the Gearhead podcast. This is brought to you by Cornwell Tools. They're the choice of professionals since 1919. Yeah, 1919. A little bit of quick math work. That's over 100 years of building top quality tools. I'm your host, Stacy David. All right, let's turn the key and get rolling. Got a lot of questions here today, so we're going to jump right into them. First one comes from Larry. Larry says, I restored my 72 Chevy Cheyenne approximately five years ago, and I installed new window regulators. And one of my windows will not roll all the way up. It lacks about a quarter of an inch from going all the way up. So his, his window's down a quarter of an inch, just enough to let a lot of rain and water come through. And he says, obviously, I wasn't satisfied with it. He says, now, recently... I purchased a good quality power window kit, one made in America, and he says that now neither window will go all the way up. He says the glass track hits the the door glass weather stripping and prevents the windows from coming all the way up. Now his question, he says, is the aftermarket door glass seals too thick and is there a company out there that makes thinner door glass seals? Well, actually, Larry, you've got some simple solutions here, but you've got a lot of them. So let's kind of go through this. First of all, this is not an uncommon problem. And this is why I always recommend when you start tearing into a new vehicle, and especially when it comes to weather stripping or old components, that you keep your old pieces and measure them up and and put them right side by side to the new replacement pieces. Because a lot of times they'll be just a hair thicker or a little bigger and, you know, a 32nd of an inch here and an eighth of an inch there. All that stuff adds up. The first thing I recommend is when you're replacing window seals or weather stripping, go with the good stuff. You know, pay the extra money to get something from, I mean, we talk about steel rubber all the time. They make really good stuff. It's made in America. It's about the closest you're going to get to OEM stuff. Some of the overseas stuff, you you just got to be careful with. Your trim and your weather stripping it's not the place to get that stuff at a swap meet in an unmarked container. <laughs> it's, you're kind of asking for it. Once you get things lined up, if it's if it's not your, your weather stripping, it could be the actual window channel. When I'm saying window channel, you can call it the window channel. You can call it the window groove. The thing that actually the glass fits in. And a lot of times if that's been replaced, sometimes you know that might have come with your electric window kit, that's a little wider. And sometimes if you have replacement glass, that can be just a hair wider. And you can usually tell when you put your glass into the original window channels sometimes they'll flop around you have to use a little more sealant in there to hold them in and a lot of times you can take a pair of pliers and kind of crush those down a little bit and give you that little extra bit that you need so it could be any of these or a combination of all of them that's making that window not go up if you have gone to an aftermarket power window system like you've got here this is not uncommon and there have been some times where I've literally had to make my own weather stripping where you kind of trim it down with a razor Razor blade on the back side and just narrow it down a little bit to where things will fit. And sometimes there's a little rounded edge on the window channel that can be crushed down a little bit. There's some issues here that you're just going to have to work through. But the first thing I would check is the quality of the aftermarket parts that you got. You just might have some cheap weather stripping and that might be the only problem. If not, you're just going to have to kind of make it fit. That's part of the magic of what we do. (laughs) (laughs) messing with aftermarket parts like this. We talk about it all the time. There's really no such thing as a simple (laughs) bolt-in. You know, it's up to you as the builder, as the restorer, as the enthusiast to make this stuff work. Like I said, you know, when you start looking at it, it's not just one part that usually causes the problem. If you get one part out, and it's just a 32nd of an inch out, and then you get another that's a 32nd of an inch out, well, now you're at an eighth of an inch out. And then it keeps going, and pretty soon you're at a quarter of an inch out. Then you're a half inch out. And this really adds up when you start dealing with body panels. You know, weather stripping, you know, fitting of windows. There's nothing worse than driving down the road and having a window bouncing around inside the window frame. And a lot of times it's because of that. And also keep in mind... A lot of time your weather stripping when it's new will be a little wider or a little flared out and it needs to set. You know, once you have it all in, you need to roll the windows up and let everything kind of sit and crush down and settle. And it could be something as simple as that. Maybe you need to push that window up in there, get it all the way up, and let those seals kind of mash down. Larry, I hope that helps, man. Just stick with it. Just don't break the window. (laughs) 
<laughs> Good luck to you, man. All right, the next question comes from Chris. And Chris has a square-body Chevy. And he wants to put a Cummins in it. That's cool. I love that, man. But he says he wants a heavy-duty frame. He wants a stock-style frame, but all boxed, all heavy-duty. He said that, you know, he wants to put the big diesel in it, but he wants something that's going to be tough, and it's going to work for him. And he's looking for an aftermarket company that makes some sort of a replacement frame for these square bodies. And I've got a great place for you, the Roadster Shop. They build great frames, great chassis. They'll set it up however you need it. Now, they're not cheap, but you do get what you pay for. We put a frame underneath the SR71 that's from the Roadster Shop. And they have a whole line of square body Chevy frames, both four-wheel drive and two-wheel drive. Listen, they'll set it up however you need it. Now, there are other companies out there. You'll just need to shop around. It sounds like you know, you want somebody that's building something that, you know, you can beat on these things. And those square body Chevys, as you know, were notorious for having weak frames. They, they broke up there with the steering box just by looking at them half the time. And then they always broke at the back at the shock mount. So getting a box in frame, getting a good frame underneath that thing is absolutely imperative. Any kind of big tires, but especially if you're going to drop a Cummins in there. So check out the Roadster Shop. You will not be disappointed, I promise. The next question here is dealing with brakes. This comes from Braden. Here's what he says. So, I blew out my rear differential on my 08 Chevy Silverado 1500 four-wheel drive. And instead of replacing the actual differential, I just replaced the whole axle with a 14 bolt from a 2011 Sierra. Now, his problem is the brakes on the old 10 bolt axle were drum style and the new brakes are discs. And he said he got everything installed, putting the truck back on the road, and now all he has is front brakes. He wants to know, what does he do here? Do I need to change my ABS module from drum module to disc? Should I eliminate it completely and just plumb the entire unit out of the truck and just run it the old school way? What, what should he do? Okay, this is something we have, we've done several shows regarding brakes on this. Brakes is one of the biggest areas that people screw up when they're building a car because nobody really talks about this stuff. So we have tried to change that and really get into it because listen, when I was first getting into building cars, that was always the thing. Grab the brakes off of something in a junkyard and bolt them on and you got disc brakes. And I remember the first time I spent extra money and put disc brakes on the rear axle of my 65 Mustang and man, they looked good and that car stopped like crap. Because I didn't have them set up right. I didn't know how. Nobody knew. It's just like you put the disc brakes on, they're supposed to work, right? Well, <laughs> they don't if you don't have the master cylinder set up right and your portioning valves and your combination valves and all of that other stuff. So we're going to go into this a little bit, uh, Braden, and see if we can kind of help you with this because this is not that hard of a problem. First of all, my suggestion, any time that you take especially like a rear axle, I recommend you get the whole brake system. Now, not the brake lines and all that stuff, but if you go to the vehicle that's this 2011 Sierra, get the master cylinder and get your combination valve. And get the whole ABS system too if you're going to go that route. Because what you've done is you had a, a truck that was discs in front and drums in the rear. And what you've done is convert to discs in front and the rear. So you need the valving and the, all the stuff that goes with disc and disc. And the simplest way to do it is just use the system. It doesn't have to be exactly the same truck, just something that had disc brakes front and rear. And the reason being, obviously, with the whole ABS system, that's its own safety deal. But let me tell you what's going on in a combination valve. What you've got in a combination valve, some people call it the proportioning valve, you know, some people call it the metering valve, and None of those are exactly correct because the combination valve has all of that in there, which is why they call it the combination valve. Here's what is inside of a combination valve. It has the pressure differential valve. Now what that is, in your master cylinder, you have a port for the front and the rear brakes. And what happens is if you lose a brake hose in the rear 
and you lose your rear brakes. That differential valve will slide over and plug those rear brakes so you don't lose your brakes and so you can get home. And that's all it does. So it's just a safety feature. It just floats in there and stays centered until you have a catastrophic brake loss somewhere. Okay, so that's in there. Then you have the metering valve. Now what the metering valve does, and this is where you're starting to get into what's going on with your brakes. The metering valve momentarily holds the pressure off of the front discs to allow the pressure to build up in the rear drums so the brakes come on at the same time. Because a rear drum takes more pressure to fight against those springs and get it up ready to hit. Because a disc brake, as soon as you hit the pedal, boom, the pressure goes right to that disc, boom, you got instant brakes. A drum's not quite like that. A drum, those all those shoes have to move. There's a lot of moving parts. So what the metering valve does is just temporarily, just a real quick split second, holds off some of the pressure on the front brakes to allow those rear brakes to catch up. Now that you have that in mind, think what happens when you have discs in the rear. So you can see that would be a problem. Then you have the proportioning valve. And what the proportioning valve does, it reduces pressure to the rear brakes in the event of a panic stop situation. When you're driving down the road and a little kid comes out in front of you and you slam on your brakes in a panic stop, without a proportioning valve, your rear brakes could lock up and you could fishtail and the rear end of that car could come around. You know, when you're watching these great stunts from movies like Smokey and the Bandit and the rear of that car is flipping around, if you'll notice, you'll see those rear brakes lock up. So what they've done is disconnect the front brakes and it gets the car to pitch left and right. And if you're trying to do cool stunts, that's one thing. But if you're out on the street or if you're on an icy road, the last thing you want is those rear brakes to lock up. So what happens with a proportioning valve at a panic stop, it keeps the rears from locking up so your front brakes still take over. So you've got all of these things working at the same time. Obviously, they're designed for the particular brakes that that vehicle had in it. So if you alter the brakes and you go from discs in front and drums in the rear, to discs front and rear, then you're going to need to change your combination valve. And I would recommend changing the master cylinder, doing the whole thing, because the system is, is made for that. That will solve your problem. If you don't do it that way, if you just want to do it the hot rod way, like you said, and just kind of do it the old school way and redo it, you need to start at the beginning and get yourself the proper master cylinder for you know for the power brakes run through and get yourself all from the aftermarket a master cylinder combination valve if you don't want to run a combination valve you need to get a separate proportioning valve there's a lot of pieces that you need to put together to make this work right and it's possible to do it that way be much much easier if you use the factory stuff i would send you back to the junkyard or the place where you got the axle and get the rest of the brake components off that truck, and you will be good to go. Hope that helps, Braden. All right, I've got a question for you guys. What is the most important tool in your garage? All right, I know you're thinking. I know you're thinking. Come on. Give me, yeah, all right. All right, well, it's probably the one you use the most, and that would be your sockets, your ratchets, your screwdrivers, and your wrenches. And if you want quality tools there, you probably ought to check out somebody like Cornwell. Now, granted, you can get some cheaper tools. And honestly, there's a place for those. Those ones that you want to bend up and heat and go into certain places. And those screwdrivers, you don't mind screwing up. <laughs> well, that's where you get the cheap stuff. But if you want real quality tools that are going to last and have a warranty, that's where you need to check out somebody like Cornwell. They've been doing it forever. And believe me, you do get what you pay for. All right, my next question comes from Donald, and Donald says, Stacy, I am purchasing a 1960 Ford F-250. Donald, what do you mean you are purchasing? You haven't decided yet? <laughs> you better make up your mind, man. That's a pretty cool truck. Somebody else is going to grab that thing if you don't make up your mind. <laughs> anyway, he goes on and says it has the 292 V8 four-speed tranny. It's a work truck with an odometer that shows 23,000 original miles. Wow. Now, the owner claims it's 123,000 miles. Yeah, that sounds more like it. And he says, I'm going to use it for my mowing business to tow my Ford diesel tractor 
and his zero turn mower. Can you direct me to any resources where I can find parts for the engine, the interior, the body, etc.? Well, Don, that's going to be a really cool work truck. <laughs> I will be surprised how long you keep that 292 engine. That was not Ford's best engine, I'll tell you that right now. There, I mean, it's a truck engine. There are so many great engines you could swap into that truck so easy. From a 302 to a 351 Windsor to a 460. Yeah, there's all kinds of options. You stick a coyote in that thing. Now, you are floating in kind of what I call the dark era of pickup trucks. From like 58 to 61-ish, that's kind of a dark era of all of them. Ford, Chevy, Dodge... <laughs> <laughs> they were not the most attractive trucks. You know, the, the stylists were kind of struggling. And for the longest time, there was hardly any aftermarket for almost any trucks of that era. Well, even the cars, too. Fortunately, over the last few years, more people have started going for them. I mean, we're doing that 59 on the show. They're cool. But finding parts for them is a little bit of a challenge. Now, I've got some here, you know, obviously LMC truck for body parts is and, and trim and glass and that kind of stuff is always a good choice. Dennis Carpenter, you know, has a lot of Ford parts. You have Max Antique Auto Parts. That's just MAC. He has all kinds of Ford stuff. And there's a place called Carolina Classics, you know. And obviously there's many more. A quick Google search and you'll be able to find a bunch of stuff. I would also suggest that with a 1960 that you start looking at some of these salvage yards, go to swap meets. There are some groups and people around that have these vehicles. And that's going to be your best bet for body parts like hoods and doors and stuff. You're not going to find too many people doing aftermarket on those yet. Those you're going to have to find as a used bit. So you're just going to have to kind of search. My recommendation, though, is if you blow the motor or the tranny up, don't rebuild it. Unless you just have to have the original engine, which I can't imagine you would. That's when I would do a swap on it. As far as your brakes and things like that, you can keep rebuilding that. But as your drivetrain, your motor, your transmission... As soon as you blow that up, I wouldn't spend the money to rebuild the old 292, man. I'd, <laughs> I'd put a 351 in there or something. You can pick those up so cheap, and there's so much aftermarket out there for that. That's going to be a fun truck to drive around and carry that old tractor with. I got a question for you, Stacy, really mm -hmm. quick. Just listen to what this guy had. So you said it's a, it's a 60 Ford pickup, mm -hmm. and he's going to be hauling around a diesel tractor. Mm-hmm. And a zero turn. Now, a zero turn is, what, 400 pounds? About the weight of a motorcycle? Mm -hmm. He doesn't say what model tractor, but in seeing a bunch of tractors recently, what's that going to do to that engine transmission combo, especially with, like, today's speed limits? I mean, even your back highways are 55 or 60. Yeah. And it was a lot different in 1960 when that engine and transmission were in there pulling loads like that. No, oh, he's... <laughs> I hear the sound of breaking crankshafts <laughs> and all kinds of destruction. Well, first of all, that four-speed transmission has got the granny low in it. So first gear's kind of out, Yeah. you know, unless you're just pulling up hills. Now, they will pull because they're the gear ratio. You know, in that truck, it's going to have low gearing anyway. Yeah, and that diesel tractor's every bit of 4,000 pounds. That's with no implement on it. If it has like a front-end loader or something, you know, it starts climbing from there. No, there's some weight going on there. I would definitely upgrade the motor and transmission just if you're going to use it but even you know then you start to look at axles and and things like that you know a lot of guys want to get these trucks and just drive them around and enjoy them as an old truck but donald here wants to use it as a work truck i mean he'll blow that thing up pretty quick that's why i really suggest he does another motor in it man even think of the axles on that because he doesn't say if it's a four-wheel drive or not yeah but those 292s uh, they're hard to get parts for too all right, that's it for today. Once again, we're brought to you by Cornwell Tools. Have a great day and get out there and work on something. <laughs>